Hello, everyone. Welcome back to school. Welcome back to A&P. What's wrong with all here? <laughs> We're gonna be cozy. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, lots of familiar faces for anybody who is new to this session of A and P. My name is Dr. Jalosny, and I'm your professor for this course. All right. Hopefully, that's obvious. All right, so overview of what we're going to be covering in a &P 2. So we're going to pick up where we left off. Uh, so when we finished the fall semester, we were talking about the heart. So we're going to carry forward, and now we're going to think about the blood. So we're going to be thinking about what's in the blood. We're going to be thinking about the vasculature. So arteries, veins, things that the blood travels through. That's going to be unit one. And then we're going to segue for unit two into the respiratory system. So we're going to think about breathing. So we're going to be thinking about how we get oxygen into our bodies, get rid of carbon dioxide, what that has to do with the blood. Like how does that get carried around your body? Um, and how that's controlled, really. Like why do we do this? Why do you breathe faster sometimes, slower other times? Like what are the constraints on that? Then our that's right. Uh, our third unit mostly is going to be our renal system. So we're going to be thinking about how we relate, like filtering blood to urination. And then we're going to talk about the GI system and continue on thinking about like, okay, eating and excrement. So we're going to have some uh, icky topics, but like really important to our daily lives topics as we come to the end of the semester. And then we'll finish up with the reproductive system. So that's our, our big overview of where we're going. Okay. So for our course overview, you're here. This is where we have lecture. Good job. <laughs> if your friend's meant to be here and there in some other room, we've got, a, you know, maybe four seats. So they can come on through. Uh, so my expectation is that you will mostly come to class in person, but I do also live stream our lectures over Zoom and to YouTube, the reason for the YouTube bit. So that means they immediately get archived. So all lectures are available on YouTube from the start of class and then they're just archived live sessions on my YouTube channel for you to look at whenever you want, when you're studying, when you want to go back to this. So uh, if you find that you're having trouble like taking notes at the speed we're going in the lecture. Do not freak out. Do not focus on taking down dictation. You can always just go back and look at okay, like what was actually important and um, just kind of watch it over again. So you'll be able to fill in anything we talk about after the fact if you get a little lost. Okay. So the expectation is that, that you're kind of coming to class in person. Our exams are in person. But if you need to occasionally come over Zoom or you're traveling, you're absent for some reason, and you need to go ahead and watch the video, that's fine. Um, you don't have to email me about it. I, I wake up every morning to about 40 emails. <laughs> so if it's just you're going to be one-off absent, and it's not a day that we have um, some exam or some assignment um, that we're going over, you're good. If you are finding that you need to use this often because there's some kind of longer-term circumstance, do come talk to me about that, because I want to make sure that you're Get it, getting what you need. But that's that's always there for you. Total time you're using. Okay. In terms of assignments, we have our four unit exams covering each unit and then a short final exam during final week, just like we did for KMP1. Uh, so those weekly quizzes will be three questions per lecture that we've covered. They'll be due on Monday right before class ahead of the game and make sure that those quizzes are up Thursdays at 11. They will still include three questions that I 
definitely expect us to get to on Friday's lecture. So unless you have something else going on, I would wait till Friday or the weekend to take them, but those should be up a little earlier this time to make sure for myself that they're open and available. Final note here is that to keep people on track with what we're covering, um, this semester I'm, I'm going to try to recommend like specific short sections of the textbook that I'd like you to review before I see you next time. Um, I have a suspicion that some people have been leaving studying like kind of to the end right before the exam at the end of our unit and actually um, reading the textbook is super helpful for this class. Like a lot of our content, we do cover it in lecture, but it's in there in, in great detail and great explanation. Um, but I know it can be overwhelming as well. Like, I had to read your textbook, right? Because I want to know what you, you see. So the first time I saw this class, I read that textbook. I had to read for about three hours before every lecture. And I'm a fast reader. So I'm going to target a couple little sections for you to look through. It's okay if you, you skim them, but, but that's what we're going to be talking about at the beginning of our next lesson. And in lecture is a good time to actually kind of dig into like, what don't you understand what it means? Okay. So those will be posted in announcements after class because they'll depend on how far we get every day. Okay. So a reminder of our overall <laughs> course structure, right? So before class, you should be taking a initial look through textbook sessions, sections and the next little section of slides that we're probably going to go over in class. Just so you know, we usually get through like 20 to 30 slides uh, per, per lecture. And you're gonna come in to lecture and I am going to talk about those concepts with you in a little bit more of an intention is a, a bit more of an informal way than the textbook presents it, All right? So if you read the textbook, <laughs> it totally makes sense, right? It's in more dense academic language, but if it makes sense in the textbook, you're, you're kind of good, honestly. Lecture is to help explain those, reinforce those, dig into things that you might have missed, um, exceptions, things you might not have understood. Okay, so we're going to do lecture, be more deliberate about, about making sure we have lots of time for questions about that content. I'm also available in office hours. Um, they're generally Monday afternoons and Thursday mornings, but there's a direct calendar linked. Um, lots of people are coming, I'll add more times. At times you can't, you can't make any of those times, so I'll, I'll expand those one on one add other blocks. That, that schedule of my office hours is also available by a QR code right next to my office door, so you can you know, see those, even if I'm updating progressively. So quizzes are after we talk about stuff, you've read some stuff, you have two attempts on each quiz, so I recommend the, the first time you take it based on like what you remember and understand from what we've done, we'll describe all the questions, and then we do score. And then you go through, look at those questions, review what do you think you missed, and then you take your second attempt. Your score is the higher of those two attempts. All right. And you study the stuff for our unit exams. I put up a full length practice exam for every lecture exam, which I have tried to pair to the distribution of topics that were covering on the real exam. Um, they are not the same questions, so be prepared. In my mind, in a &P, we have a lot of like, this versus that, we have a lot of compare and contrast things. So you'll probably have noticed if you've been in my section before, you'll notice rapidly if you're a new kid, um, that, you know, if we have something on the practice exam that increases something or other, it's quite likely that the real exam won't be that exact thing, but it'll be something that like, decreases that property or some other similar kind of error. Not hard and fast rule, but like, I want you to know, like, if we're talking about lungs, um, if you only expect there to be three questions on the lungs and suddenly like half the exam is on, on lungs, like taking the practice test should tell you um, that you maybe need to cover that.
in terms of stuff that is hopefully squared away already. You do need to be registered for a lab with this course. So our labs alternate between anatomy and physiology labs, but you only have to be signed up for one lab section. Um, do make sure that you are signed up for an A and P2 lab. I am not teaching any of the labs this semester, but talking to the lab instructors, it seems like some people mm -hmm. signed up for an A and P1 lab over again. Um, so make sure that you signed up for the lab for the right course. The a and two labs are the Tuesday and Thursday ones. So remember to get those anatomy pre-labs in ahead of time before your lab section meets. Um, and this is, this is just a, a tip of mine from past years. When you get to your first physiology lab, I believe you'll be given a physiology lab calendar. I recommend that you read those carefully on the first day and put in any dates of quizzes and assignments onto your personal calendar then, um, because I've occasionally heard from students that some quiz or other took them by surprise in lab, but they shouldn't because you have the calendar. So this is, this is my tip to you on that. Our materials are the same as they were for a and one So you have the human physiology textbook, which is what we're following along with the lecture. And you have some atlas that you are using as a reference for anatomy lab. Um, we are going to be using the Respondus Lockdown browser for our exams this semester, even though we are taking them in person. Um, link to download can be found here. It's also on my CSS. Uh, and we'll make sure that that works by putting a tester of this system up for uh, Monday. I'll give you points for doing it, but it will just be for completion. So some free points uh, if you do that. In addition to our content quiz that'll be due Monday, which will just be the stuff that we cover on Friday this week. <laughs> so in terms of upcoming things that we do, okay, you're, for Monday, you're gonna have a three question quiz on basically kind of like some Physics of blood flow is what we're going to start with at, during our next session. We'll have a, a quick test of the lockdown browser system to make sure that works for everybody. Um, and we'll also have an extra credit assignment available for you reviewing chapter 13. So basically our part stuff. Um, I want to make sure it doesn't overlap with too much with the stuff that you'll be doing in the lab later in the semester or an exact clone of things that we did in the fall. So you going to have to give me a second to, to think about that and talk to Dr. Jupiter, but that'll be up soon. Um, I'll do be due Wednesday next week because I like to kind of space out the class. But do it. I, it will be better for you if you review that stuff sooner rather than later. I'll say, because we're continuing with blood. So take a few minutes to check through the syllabus if you have not done so, um, and so let me know if you have questions. So I'll kind of circle around by you to that. <laughs> I'm gonna resize my slides. <laughs> it's also just like the brightness. my steps in the semester. Anybody have any good New Year's resolutions? I try not to make things resolutions because it's like the guarantee that I'll fail. <laughs> we do what we can do. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, I know that's going to be kind of long, but any questions at this point? Okay, cool. My office, if you have questions later, it's right at the end of the hallway with your anatomy and physiology lab, kind of at that key junction. Come visit. I have lots of big cozy armchairs. I got a little electric fireplace, and I usually have snacks. <laughs> You're invited, basically. Okay. So, we're not hearing content that you need to memorize or remember for today. But before we get into nitty gritty stuff, I uh, want to kind of like zoom out and remember probably why you're you're taking A and P, like why most of you were required to take this course. I find relatively few people are in here just because, right? You've been here for a reason. Um, so we're going to watch a short video about a patient experience, basically, because um, a lot of this is focused on understanding healthcare fields, healthcare conditions, 
So we're going to watch something about neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And as you're going through, I want you to think about, okay, what are some things that you already know from AMP1 that you think might be kind of like relevant to the condition that we're looking at in this video? I want you to kind of look forward a little bit. Like what else would you want to understand to really understand more what's going on here? Um, and then we're going to have a, a picture of a couple of treatments for, for this musician that pulled from minute seven, second 12 in this video. And um, I'm going to have you discuss with the people around you, think of a couple guesses as to uh, why some of these treatments or, or, or do anything at all for people with this condition. Um, so I'm gonna pull that up and we're gonna hope I can figure out how to get this to go over the room speakers rather than the computer speakers. Louder. Louder. Yeah. Not louder. Yeah. 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 Today on Behind the Mystery, we're talking to King, his wife Linda, and how they're living with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, or NOH. Never heard of it? Well, let's start with the basics. N, neurogenic, associated with the nervous system. O, orthostatic, related to standing up. H, hypotension, abnormally low blood pressure. In the studio this morning to help us understand this condition is neurologist Dr. Stuart Isaacs. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to hear from Keith and his wife Linda in just a bit. But first, let's talk about what is NOH. I've never heard of it. Well, NOH, as you just pointed out, is neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And it's a condition that's not very common, but occurs in people who have Parkinson's disease and some related conditions called multiple system atrophy. And the problem with NOH is usually when we stand up, we release a chemical, a chemical called norepinephrine. And this causes the blood vessels to constrict and the heart to beat faster. So blood pressure comes up and we don't feel like the blood pressure is dropping. We don't have feelings of lightheadedness or dizziness. Many people with Parkinson's disease, probably about one in five have symptoms from NOH. And when they stand up, not enough norepinephrine is released and the blood pressure goes down and down. And they begin to develop lightheadedness and dizziness and they might even pass out. So in terms of how many people are affected, it's one in five. One in five will have symptoms. And this may be provoked by dehydration or not feeling well or taking medication that may lower blood pressure. And then when symptoms come out, we have to pay attention to the symptoms. And one way we do this is we have people check their blood pressure. They can check in in the visit when they come to our office. They can check it at home. Often after breakfast might be a time of day when it's the lowest. They can keep a diary of how it changes around meal time or after meals or when they're lying in bed at night. And when we find that blood pressure drops, we always look for a key uh, point, which is the heart rate. Usually when blood pressure falls and someone feels lightheaded, the heart rate goes up and up and up. But in neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, in NOH, the heart rate doesn't change much at all. And that's really a key for a doctor and nurse to make the diagnosis of NOH. We recently spent the day with Keith, who has Parkinson's, and his wife, Linda. His diagnosis of NOH came several years into the onset of Parkinson's. Let's hear more. Joining our next more coffee, sure. For yeah. okay. It was 10 years after his Parkinson's diagnosis that Keith and his wife Linda noticed signs and symptoms of what would eventually be diagnosed as NOH. Episodes were sporadic. 
you know, kind of stumbling as after being in a car ride or going up a set of steps. Why, you know, why all of a sudden would you be dizzy? That was the time when we thought it was just a just a periodic event that there was a, was happening every now and then. NOH diagnosis was a little bit more difficult because initially I just thought it was the other shoe that fell off the Parkinson's. He had a couple falls, not just down the the steps, but a, a couple general falls. Like, okay, does this mean this is what happens with Parkinson's? And we've been educated enough that to know that everybody is different. So we were also very fortunate that our general practitioner and our movement specialist spoke to each other. So between the two of them came up with, okay, there's, we've got some blood pressure issues here. Keith, a former pilot and self-described gym rat, has learned to manage his NOA symptoms. He makes sure to drink and during those circumstances. Other lifestyle changes as recommended by his doctor. And yeah, his, uh, his, his, his impatience. And sometimes you're in a situation where you don't know how severe your your uh, episode's going to be. And uh, uh, so I uh, uh, have a routine where I get up and uh, and I give the blood a chance to kind of, and the blood pressure to, to equalize. And uh, I've uh, been able to avoid any uh, any mishaps. And just while that, it's a simple you know, set of rules. They keep a blood pressure log and communicate regularly with their healthcare team. Communication with your doctor is extremely important. College sweethearts, the Halls have always been an on-the-go family. They're taking steps to help ensure they continue to stay active, even with Keith's Parkinson's and NOH. When Keith's first initial diagnosis, to me, it wasn't devastating. I'm always taken aback when people say that. So to us, it was just part of what our journey was going to be. It might be tiring, but I think to have things move smoothly and, and you do have to think about everything. So if you are traveling or you're going out, you make sure that you, you know have your snacks and your water and your glasses. <laughs> it's just part of who we are and what we're doing. And they're committed to spreading awareness. I think the best thing is to, is to, to look into lo what your local resources are. Support groups can be wonderful, but they also cannot be for everyone. Finding classes that you can either do together or finding your own thing that you can do. Now, Doctor, while you're not Kate's physician, can you relate this to how your experience has been with your patients? <laughs> well, I think what we heard from Keith and his wife are that these symptoms come on very gradually. It's hard to sometimes recognize that they're new symptoms. He's had symptoms of Parkinson's for several years where he's had trouble maybe arising from a chair and walking, having good balance and movement. And now different symptoms may occur that can be confused with the mobility problems of Parkinson's. So it's important when you have any types of symptoms standing or after a meal to bring those up at a visit with the doctor and nurse and talk about how the symptoms may be different. It may be early symptoms of NOH. Now, doctor, once properly diagnosed, are there ways to manage NOH symptoms? When they stand up, they should do it gradually. Sit at the side of the bed for a couple of minutes, then stand up and before they walk, wait a couple of minutes. Sometimes squeezing the calf muscles or the gluteal muscles can help maintain blood pressure when they stand up as well. Some of our patients wear compression stockings, usually up to the waist, so it can really push the blood back from the stomach and also the legs. We tell our patient to remain well hydrated, to really concentrate on drinking a lot of water and other fluids and adding salt to the diet, especially drinking those fluids in the morning hours when blood pressure is lower. So our patients elevate the head of the bed when they sleep. When they don't work, we have medications that can help as well. Our patients always have to talk with their doctors and nurses to make sure that whatever they're anticipating or doing to try to treat this problem is done with medical guidance. It's a manageable and that you can modify the uh the uh, response that you uh, that you uh, have to uh, the NOH by being patient, you can live with it, and you can you can do well with it. So, doctor, to summarize everything, what are the key things we need to remember here? Well, I think it's important to realize that it's NOH is very common in Parkinson's. It's even more common 
and multiple system atrophy. And so whenever you have symptoms that occur when you stand up, always think that it could be a symptom of NOH and bring it up at the next visit with your doctor or nurse. And to make the diagnosis, the blood pressure has to be checked seated and also standing with the heart rate to make that diagnosis. Because the diagnosis has to be made so we can use effective management to try to improve the symptoms and not have people doing less and less activity, becoming isolated, becoming depressed, not going out and going about their day because the blood pressure is too low. Doctor, thank you so much for your time and all the information you've given us today. Yeah, thank you. And if you'd like more information on NOH, you can go to this website, nohmatters.com, or just check out our website, balancingact.com. All right. I will bring the lights back. And... I'm going to ask you to think about these questions and chit chat with your neighbor about them. I'll leave them up for a minute or two. And then on the next page, I have a, a screenshot of that list of treatments and I'll, I'll pull that through once you remember what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to flip that list of treatments. <laughs> I'm going to 
Don't all diagnoses us right now. <laughs> this is the takeaway. Um, but, but we'll come back to this stuff periodically. It's kind of nice to, to zoom out from the slog of this being a class and, and think about how it like affects your lives, affects people's lives. It's a little more fun. So that, I think, yeah, is it for what we're, what we're doing today. If you have any additional questions um, I'm seeing, um, here is, is my instructions to you for what I would like you to take a look at before we talk on Friday. So I'll post this as an announcement as well, but every chapter has bullet point summaries at the end. So let's get through that. We'll be going through the first little bit on Friday. So the other will be focusing on section 48.1. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 